everybody, and thanks for uh, joining us today. What we wanted to do today is to um, share a little bit of background information about um, this uh, new web resource that PRI has been developing starting two years ago, but really uh, a much more concerted effort um, beginning in uh, the fall of last year to develop our Earth at Home website. And uh, sort of the underlying philosophy for Earth at Home is that it's going to be a one-stop shop um, for Earth science materials. Uh, really to help people uh, get the background that they need to uh, both uh, teach about the earth and, and learn more about the earth. And uh, one of our, you know, one of our uh, foundational principles is that Earth at Home is, is open access. It's free for anybody to uh, use. And most of the materials on Earth at Home have Creative Commons licensing that goes for the text, that goes for uh, most of the images. And so it's really supposed to be uh, sort of an open and free resource for you to use in your um, classrooms or, or wherever as, as you see fit. Um, so what we're going to do here today is I want to start us off by talking sort of broadly about some of the different resources on Earth at Home, and then we're going to dial in and focus in on resources um, sort of specific to the southeastern United States. Uh, I'd encourage you to follow along if, if you wish, um, or explore Earth at Home on your own. What we're going to do here is kind of talk about Earth at Home for a half hour or so. And then what we want to do is um, carve out a bit of time for you to, you know, explore Earth at Home on your own. And then we can come back and sort of discuss some of the things that you found on Earth at Home that you think might be um, useful uh, for yourself and, and uh, students and what have you, who you work with. And then uh, we, we can kind of compare ideas about you know, what, uh, what folks find useful about Earth at Home, as well as you know, we'd love to get feedback on, on what we might add or change to make Earth at Home more useful for you. Um, so again, uh, please do feel free to follow along. I'm gonna be scrolling through some pages pretty quickly, um, but of course I encourage you to go back and Take a, take a look at those pages. As we uh, go through this, we'll be adding the links to the chat so that, uh, to help you kind of follow along as, as we go through. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to mention um, before we, we get too far here is at the bottom of every single Earth at Home page, there's a subscribe box. And so if you wanna receive email updates about the newest additions to Earth at Home, please add your email address to that. Uh, to that box, we promise not to spam you. You know, you'll probably get updates no, you know, no more frequent than you know about once a month or thereabouts as as major new additions are made to Earth at Home. We'd like to highlight um, those for you. So if you're interested in, in receiving those, please do subscribe. Um, so everything that I'm going to uh, share with you here um, over the next uh, few minutes is accessible from the top level menu of the Earth at Home website. And uh, this same banner with all these drop downs and navigation appears on every single page on Earth at Home. So you can kind of find your way back to, you know, to where you started uh, pretty easily. So there are several main parts of Earth at Home that I want to highlight. Uh, there are regional guides to Earth science, and we're going to spend some time um, digging in on those here in a little while. But first, what I wanted to introduce is a, are a few other resources related to Earth at Home, including our digital encyclopedia, um, some quick guides and FAQs that we've developed, as well as some uh, resources um, that we call virtual science. These are sort of, uh, you know, virtual online uh, toolkits for your, for your classroom. So we'll, we'll dig into those a little bit. Let's start out here first by going to the, um, to the digital encyclopedia. So the digital encyclopedia is a place to come to for background information about um, earth science. And this is very much under development. Um, eventually what we'd like this to become is sort of a full-fledged online open access textbook about not only geology, but earth science more broadly. Um, we do have some chapters online now, as well as a bunch of um, sort of introductory vignettes that will eventually be expanded into full chapters as time goes on, you know, just to sort of show you the main topics that we're looking at developing. We're going to have chapters about earth system science, chapters about um, 
sort of the fundamentals of geology, you know, minerals, rocks, how the world works, plate tectonics, hazards that are sort of a consequence of plate tectonics and that sort of thing. Overviews of geologic time and earth history. Um, we already have actually very detailed overviews of um, fossils, paleontology and evolution that we, that we developed as part of our digital atlas of ancient life project. And we're not gonna spend uh, time talking about those here today, but I explore you um, if you wish to, you know, click on the digital encyclopedia of ancient life. And that's a fairly uh, well-developed online textbook at this point, um, covering many, but certainly not all areas of, of paleontology. And we also have a lot of content that's being developed related to climate, climate change, and also energy. And I'll, I'll highlight one of those new resources here in just a, just a moment. Um, so going back up to the top here, just to kind of show you what this is all about, I wanted to highlight uh, the minerals chapter of uh, the digital encyclopedia of earth science, you know, to just sort of give you an idea of what's here. The, um, one of the things that we do in the, in the full-fledged, um, you know, digital encyclopedia chapters is we provide uh, PowerPoint files as well as zip files showing all the images that appear on the pages. So if the, you know, if you find the, that the content is useful to use in your classroom, all you have to do is just click the button and you'll get, you'll be able to download all the images in, in one place. So this introductory uh, page about minerals, you know, just sort of covers the, the basics that many of us talk about when we when we cover minerals with our students you know sort of starting at the at the basic level of you know how, you know how minerals are, are of course like everything composed of atoms and elements and you know how atoms and elements fit together ultimately to to create mineral structure um, and then we go over some of the basics of of mineral identification and you know one of the things that we've tried to do wherever possible um, in the in the digital encyclopedia of, of earth science, as well as that other uh, digital encyclopedia of ancient life, is to incorporate things like interactive three D models that are you know that are fun to fun to explore, and you know certainly not as good as the real thing, but kind of the next best thing in an online environment. We've also incorporated lots of videos that just show you know basic things like streak tests that one might use to try to identify a mineral specimen. Um, so that's just an example of, you know, what we're kind of covering with respect to minerals. I'm going to go back now um, to that to that landing page for uh, for the digital encyclopedia, and we can look at some of the other resources there. Um, one of the uh, resources that we've developed very very recently are uh, Earth Science Quick Facts. John, I um, think maybe your um, your uh, page is paused because we're oh. just seeing the uh, the homepage. Thanks for letting me know. Let's see here. I'm not quite sure why that is. I'm going to stop sharing and start resharing. I apologize, everyone. Let's try that again. Now we're in business. Thanks. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. I apologize. And please do interrupt again if that happens again. I'm not sure why that happened. So um, one of the one of the other things that we've developed recently are um, what we call Earth Science Quick Fact pages um, that highlight, you know, some of the basic, uh, you know, basic factoids about Earth science associated with each state in the in the United States. And we've just finished wrapping up this collection of pages for the southeastern United States. So we've got a bunch of uh, pages that we've developed that uh, characterizes, you know, the official state fossils, rocks, minerals, gems, highest and lowest points of elevation in, in each state, um, as well as some new geologic maps that we've um, generated. Let's see, does anybody have a state they'd like to look at in the southeast? We've got Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, and so on, any requests? not, I will pick Virginia. There's a Georgia request. There's a Georgia request. Great. Let's check out Georgia. Okay. So for Georgia, um, the first thing that appears on every one of these pages, and I'll show you another way to get to these resources here in a second, are geologic maps. So 
we've been creating new geologic maps for um, using GIS software for every uh, state in the country. And um, these are developed to be relatively simple maps that aren't, aren't too busy, that sort of quickly communicate information about um, you know, the geologic ages of rocks um, at the surface or, or just below um, the, the surface of the ground. So in all these maps, um, you know, Cenozoic aged rocks are yellow, Mesozoic are shades of green and, and Paleozoic are shades of uh, blue. It's a little difficult to distinguish the different, um, you know, the, the different ages, but we, wanna, we want maps that quickly communicate to folks roughly how age, you know, at least to era different, um, different uh, rock units are on the, on the maps. And that was one of the motivations of making these. Lots of times geologic maps are, are very complicated and a lot of the maps that are available, you know, online um, do have a lot of detail that sometimes makes them difficult to use in, in classroom settings. So again, we're making new maps for, you know, for all 50 states. And all of these maps have Creative Commons licensing, so please do feel free to use them as you wish. So the official state uh, fossil of Georgia is a shark's tooth. The species isn't um, specified, but Georgia, of course, has lots of uh, Cenozoic and I believe some Cretaceous shark's teeth. As far as I've been able to figure out, Georgia does not yet have a state rock, so it'd be great for folks in, in Georgia to come up with a state rock. The state mineral is storolite. Um, this mineral that sort of forms these uh, little uh, crisscrossing shapes. The state gem of uh, Georgia is, is quartz. Here's a variety of quartz, of course, it's amethyst, it's colored purple. And then the highest and lowest elevations in Georgia, the highest elevation is Brasstown Bald, and then the lowest elevation, of course, is the, is the Atlantic coast. And then we've listed a few uh, places to, to visit, Fern Bank, the Telus Science Museum and, and Brasstown Bald. Um, we'd love suggestions. If, you're, if, you're, uh, if you live in Georgia and you have some suggestions of cool places that the public can go to learn more about, you know, the earth science of Georgia, either museums or, um, you know, places to go visit, please do let us know and we'd be happy to add more to, to these listings. And then we have links at the bottom to additional resources. And um, these are, uh, these are uh, this is connected to our um, regional guide series that we'll hear more about here in just a second. So I'm gonna attempt to go back again and hope the page doesn't, doesn't lock up. Somebody let me know if it does. Are we good? We're good. Okay, all righty. Um, We've also developed a, a new geologic timescale page for uh, Earth at Home. I'm gonna click that here. So you know that most of you have, are, are probably somewhat familiar with the geologic timescale. What we've done on this page though, is we've taken the timescale and we've, uh, we've divided it up uh, time period by time period. And we've highlighted for folks uh, some of the major events that happened in Earth history during each one of these um, during each one of these intervals. So, just as an example, of course, during the Quaternary period, you know that's when uh, numerous uh, species of megafauna went extinct. It's also the time when um, our genus Homo evolved. Uh, in terms of Earth history, uh, Northern Hemisphere glaciation um, started at this time. One of the things that we've done um, in association with this geologic timescale is we've created maps showing where rocks of particular ages can be found, which I think is useful for um, classroom presentation. So if I scroll down here, just an example, you know, of, of uh, Mesozoic aged rocks, um, the Mesozoic, of course, is the age of dinosaurs. So if you're having a conversation with your students about, you know, where could you go to find, potentially find dinosaur remains, you might show a map like, like this, you know, I grew up in Wisconsin, I was told there's no, you know, there's no dinosaurs in Wisconsin, no matter how, you know, how deep you might dig in your backyard, it's because rocks of that age are not preserved there. So you'd need to go to some of these places where, um, you know, uh, uh, Mesozoic age rocks are actually found. So we've created maps, um, you can, you can explore on your own for each, uh, 
major division of the geologic time scale for the um, the lower 48 states. Okay, I'm going to go back to that um, digital encyclopedia page just to look at one last thing. I mentioned that we've been um, also developing a lot of uh, new content related to um, climate, climate change, and energy. And, and some of this content is being uh, ported over from our uh, PRI's uh, Teacher-Friendly Guide to Climate Change, which if I remember right, was published in, in 2017. So we're taking some of that content and updating it and, and adding it to Earth at Home. And, and one of the uh, pages that our colleague Ingrid Zabel has recently added is on climate change mitigation. So this is another one of these sort of detailed chapters with uh, multiple pages. I'm gonna click on mitigation strategies and um, this is a page that just went live a couple a couple days ago that um, our again our colleague Ingrid uh, developed. That's got a lot of great um, information on it, just about different uh, uh, strategies for for climate change mitigation and and ideas for things that people can do uh, to make a difference. So again, I encourage you to um, explore that on your own. I'm going to go back up here again to uh, the very top of the Earth at Home banner. So we've been in the digital encyclopedia. What I'd like to do now is very briefly highlight our um, quick guides and FAQs. This is a page that you can um, you can go to to uh, get very quick introductions to different earth science topics. If you don't have time to read, you know, a long page about um, or a lot. A long chapter, you know, with a lot of details about topics like rocks. You can you can click on um, these links, and it'll lead you to just very short and very accessible introductions to to these topics. So we also have you know introduction to plate tectonics, quick guides to common fossils, earth hazards, climate. Um, here's that you know the earth science quick facts that I that I already shared with you um, related to you know official state rocks and minerals and that that sort of thing. Further down on the page, we have uh, answers to uh, frequently asked questions. This is sort of a random assortment, but we're, we're hoping it's gonna grow over time. These are questions that we find um, show up on internet searches. And so we're trying to answer some of these questions that people have. One of the most recent of these that we've added um, has been uh, the question, how did the Grand Canyon form? So right now we're working on developing earth science resources related to the Southwestern United States. So we wanted to, um, you know, add a page answering this, you know, a question, a common question that, that folks have who visit the Grand Canyon SAC and, and briefly mention. Um, so either Don or Rob, you wanna say a bit about, about that? I'm gonna uh, stop sharing. Uh, about sort of the, the overview, and then I can talk a little bit about the catalog. Um, uh, so uh, the virtual field work, uh, first off, I'll note one of the ideas of virtual field work is not to uh, replace actual field work, but rather uh, to serve as a catalyst for it, to get people interested in going out. And there are a lot of resources generally on the value of, uh, of field work and um, how to go about making these uh, resources on your own. We think that um, one really powerful approach for using virtual fieldworks is to engage students in creating them alongside with you. Uh, and that sort of uh, forces um, students to go outside and uh, turns the problem on its head of technology keeping uh, kids and adults inside and instead gets them going outside with their technology to capture uh, aspects of the environment that they can share with others. And um, I'll just uh, note there's uh, tools and tips on that and uh, um, links to lots of um, resources for um, helping to make these things in various ways and uh, supporting them. Uh, this, for example, was uh, taken with an app called Google Street View, which you're probably familiar with uh, Street View in, in Google Maps. Well, you can make those yourself with your phone. It's very simple uh, to do and, um, and a, a free app once you've got 
once you've got a smartphone and a data plan um, and lots of other resources listed there. Uh, and I'll also just briefly point you to the, um, oops, to go uh, back to the VFE uh, homepage. Um, there's a story, uh, um, a VFE uh, vignette um, for uh, thinking about why to do this and, and telling a story of what it might look like in uh, your classroom. And now I'll hand it over to uh, Rob and stop sharing myself. Okay. I will. My screen. So you'll notice that in the VFE section of Earth at Home, there are these gold bars that each take you to a different section of the site. So Don talked about the pages that explain the rationale behind doing virtual field work and making them um, and, and the role that they play in science education. We also have a couple of pages devoted to virtual field experiences that you can use uh, with, with examples that you can actually use in your classroom before you've made one yourself. So for example, if I were to click on these case examples, you'll see a few um, examples in the table of contents here. Shale Hills is a place in Pennsylvania um, there are none right now for the Southeast in our case examples, but that could change. Uh, a couple in California and one in Denver. And so the idea here is that we're highlighting in each of these um, a way to, to create and use virtual field experiences. So you can use them, but you can also uh, directly but you can also see them as uh, examples of things that you could do for yourself. And as Don mentioned, most of the technology we use is, is low cost um, uh, software and hardware that uh, you may be able to get for yourself or you may even already have. Um, I'm gonna go now, so there are these highlighted VFEs, but there's also a VFE catalog the highlighted VFDs includes just four examples, but the catalog includes dozens. And there are two categories. The first is a map of VFDs that have been created by teachers associated with PRI workshops. And these are not necessarily polished VFDs, um, but here's a, uh, a map of them. You will notice that we actually don't have any from the Southeast for a strange historical contingency that has to do with our funding. We received funding from the National Science Foundation to create them for uh, basically the states uh, in, in the, the Western two thirds of the country. Um, and we had some already for the Northeast. So we're actually, that is the next place that we um, are, uh, want to make some. And we're in the process of making one for Mississippi right now at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. There is also a list of VFEs state by state. And um, so there isn't a map of these yet. A map would be, uh, we may eventually create one, but there are lots and lots of them on here. So it might be a little um, uh, full. But anyway, you can look for your state and then click on any one of these. So there are a number from the Southeast uh, and the examples are, are come from a wide variety of, of uh, individuals and organizations, some of whom are educators and made these for activities. Some of them are really more like kind of picture shows, which are not necessarily educational by themselves, but you can use them as the basis for something more educational. So we would just invite you to look through and see what's useful. But we would also ask if you know of something from your area, or maybe you've even created something, we would like to know about it so we could add it to this list. And I will stop sharing and hand it back to John. Okay, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Don. I'm going to share my screen here again.
<clears throat> All right. Um, again, under virtual science, so uh, Rob and Don were just talking about virtual field work. I want to highlight uh, virtual collections really, really quickly. So uh, even before the pandemic, PRI started uh, using a, a process called photogrammetry, photogrammetry to create um, 3D models, kind of like that sample of amethyst that I showed you earlier, for specimens in our collections. And uh, we've created over five, actually over 600 3D models of uh, fossils and uh, rock and mineral samples from, from PRI's research collections, as well as our, our teaching collections. And so I just want to highlight that that these exist. So just as an example, we could go under, um, you know, we could go under uh, arthropods. Let's see if we can find a, a quick trilobite model. Here's trilobites. These are all sort of arranged like virtual drawers of specimens that an instructor might uh, put up on, uh, you know, or, or, or bring out on a lab bench during a classroom activity. And you've seen we've bounced off to our our, um, another PRI website here called the Digital Atlas of Ancient Life. That's where the fossil models are stored. I can bring up this uh, Flexicalamini from Ohio, this little, tri this little trilobite. If you haven't used these before in the classroom, um, I, I think they're kind of fun to, to work with. You can click the uh, full screen mode here at the bottom and it, you know, it brings up them up to full screen size. And these are really useful for um, you know, sharing features of fossils with your students. Uh, I don't teach much anymore, but when I used to, you know, I'd be in front of a, you know, in, in front of a, a lecture room and I'd hold up a little specimen in my hand and students in the back of the room wouldn't be able to see it, you know. So this is, a, a, I think, a useful way of sort of highlighting, you know, the features of, of fossils, either when um, you don't have the real thing on hand or if it's just not practical for whatever reason to, to be able to pass specimens around in the in the classroom. So again, we've created, I'm gonna just go back here. We've created again, over 600 of these models, uh, both of fossils and uh, rock and mineral samples from, from PRI's collection. So I, I encourage you to uh, explore that resource. So what I want to do now, so we've talked about the digital encyclopedia, we've talked about quick guides and FAQs, we've talked about virtual science. What I want to do now is focus on regional guides. So I'm going to click this link here at the top. Um, we are creating a series of uh, regional guides to the earth science of particular places. And one of our goals here is to, you know, show you know, show every person who lives in the United States, no matter where they live, that there's something really cool beneath their, their feet. The earth has a story to tell really no matter where you're at in the, in the world um, as, you know, as well as within the United States. Um, this part of the Earth at Home project I wanna acknowledge is, is being developed um, with an IMLS, an Institute of Museum and Library Sciences grant that PRI received um, last year. So it's supporting the development of these regional guides to um, earth science. These regional guides in turn are being uh, built upon the foundation that uh, Rob and, and Don and their colleagues in the education department at PRI developed in the form of the teacher-friendly guides to earth science series. Rob, do you want to say a few brief words about the teacher-friendly guide series? Some of the folks on this call may be familiar with these books that PRI has published. Uh, yeah, sure. I will put a link um, in where you can see uh, the, these books. Um, so the, the original idea many years ago, as John said, was to make it easier to teach about local and regional earth science in the classroom, knowing that or science teachers are busy people who don't have time to go into the research literature looking for the details of the geology of their area. Lots of states and museums have created individual resources for maybe a part of a state, sometimes a whole state, um, but um, often missing kind of the regional context. So uh, we decided it would be useful to create 
uh, a series of, of books for each region of the country. And we thought, you know, it's not that such a, that previous people may have thought of such a thing, but, um, you know, how do you develop an, um, a business model around that? But as a, as a natural history museum, you know, we were, I think maybe the, the right people to take that on. And so we, over the span of many years, got a number of, of private grants, uh, private foundation grants, and then a big grant from the National Science Foundation to um, put together these books. Each of them is laid out in a similar way, similar content um, or a similar uh, cha uh, chapter headings, but of course, um, tailored to the local and regional geology of, of those individual places. And then we went and found a team of writers many of whom were specialists in those particular places. And, uh, and they wrote uh, the bulk of these and then we added them, added them to them <laughs> and put them together into these, into these books. Um, so the books are available for also for free. You can download a PDF. Um, the, the South one from the Southeast, I think was published around 2016 maybe. Um, uh, however, uh, what John and Liz have been doing is, is a big improvement, honestly. Uh, you know, the, the book is nice. You can download it. You have a PDF. You can flip through it. But it's, you know, because of all of the limitations of publishing and so on, it's not nearly as visually rich. And, and it's, in some respects, not as up to date as, as what's on Earth at Home now. So, but just so that you know that these exist and, um, you know, a little by little, we're moving across the country on Earth at Home, and eventually all of the guides will be moved into these much more visually rich interactive resources on, on Earth at Home. Uh, back to you, John. That's, that's great. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, so as Rob mentioned, we're, you know, we're, we're starting to port over this content and sort of build on it and add to it, um, focusing on, you know, every, well, Seven, seven different regions of the of the United States, and so we've we've sort of carved out regions, sort of based on how they were carved out in the um, in the teacher friendly guide series. So we began with the southeastern United States, and we'll dive into that here in just a second. Um, we recently finished the South Central United States. Liz and I are currently working on developing. Um, content for the southwestern United States. And that should be done later this, um, hopefully later this month. And so we're just sort of moving in a clockwise fashion around the, around the um, United States. So we'll finish up with the Northeast sometime later in the, in the fall, we hope. That's, that's the goal at least. Um, so let's dig into the southeastern United States. And uh, Liz is gonna introduce um, a couple of pages uh, for the Southeast in particular, but I wanted to just note that the way that all of these regional guides are, are structured is sort of the same. There are some topics that are broad and they relate to the entire region. So we have pages associated with the geologic history of the southeastern United States, the climate of the southeastern United States, and then earth hazards associated with the southeastern United States. And then what we've done is we've sort of focused in on other topics at a narrower scale. So topics like rocks, fossils, topography, energy, and mineral resources, we focused in on at, we call, at what we call the physiographic province. I'm going to scroll back up to this map at the top. So if we look at the southeastern United States, there are sort of three main uh, physiographic provinces. And a physiographic province is sort of defined by a combination of both its geologic history and its modern day topography. And those things are often, as, as most of you know, are, are commonly linked. They, they tend to have an association with one another. And so that, that sort of is the basis for these subdivisions. So with that said, Liz, would you like to introduce um, the geologic history page and the fossils of the coastal plain region? And I will stop sharing here. Okay, let's see if I can get my screen to share properly. Um, all right, we'll see how it goes. Let's see. So does that look good? Yeah, that works. Okay. 
Um, so I'm going to be sharing, I guess, two pages. Uh, first of them is geologic history of the southeastern United States. So as John said, uh, there are pages covering a number of different topics for the southeastern US and in each region of the United States will be similar. We'll be covering uh, sort of the same sort of topics. So geologic history, climate, uh, mineral resources, energy, all those things. Some of them are covered at the whole region scale and some of them are covered at the physiographic region scale. So in each section of the United States that we are working on, geologic history will be covered at the whole region scale. Um, so in terms of how we translated the book to the web uh, version of, of Earth at Home, uh, basically the layout of the text has to be a little bit different. So we've added a lot of, a lot of subheadings and things to help with page navigation. Uh, and we've you know done a little bit of editing here and there. And in some cases we may have done some additions or updates to the text depending on what was needed. In the case of the geologic history sections, generally speaking, there aren't a lot of updates to the text because not a lot has changed since these things were written. Um, and Southeast in particular actually has a fairly complex geologic history because of course, early on, it's very tectonically active and then later on becomes a, a passive margin. Uh, so the other thing that we've tried to do with Earth at Home as opposed to the earlier books is just update the visuals. Uh, because this is a web, we don't have to worry about fitting everything onto the printed page and how long the book is gonna be or something like that. Uh, and I think as John mentioned before, we've been trying to mostly use images that are under Creative Commons or public domain licensing. Um, so some of the images do come from the books. For example, I think this image here uh, of the Grenville Mountains comes from the book. So in some cases, we've added color to these and maybe done some um, updates on the labeling or something. And others are things that we pulled off the web. So this is a, a book image. These pictures we pulled off the web and they have Creative Commons licensing. So we have um, some explanations of what you're looking at. In this case, uh, nice, Precambrian nice uh, from the Southeast. So geologic history just kind of gives a whole overview that, that can tie the other sections together. Um, and like I said, quite a bit of Southeast geologic history, the interesting stuff happens in the Precambrian and Paleozoic. So for Southeast, this is quite long. We do have uh, uh, some global maps with labels on them, another updated uh, picture from the teacher friendly guide. And uh, it go this one goes on for quite a while, so. There's a lot to learn about the southeastern US. And I just don't know, let's see if there's anything in particular to point out. Uh, we do have a little bit on the formation of the Mississippi embayment, how it gets up here into Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, and this comes up a, a little bit in the uh, geologic history of section two as well, sorry, as a formation of the Florida platform and things like that. So this goes through the, the history in, in quite a bit of detail. Um, yeah. So that's geologic history. Uh, fossils are covered at the physiographic region uh, size. So there's coastal plain fossils, uh, Blue Ridge and Piedmont, and then inland basin fossils. Uh, fo fossils of the coastal plain is the richest section from this area. And there's quite a bit of Cenozoic, so, and, and a bit of Cretaceous as well. Um, and I guess one sort of random Paleozoic fossil there for anyone that likes trilobites. So as I mentioned, we're, we're trying to upgrade the images here. Some of these come from other PRI websites. So for instance, this image of the Cretaceous Western Interior Seaway. Uh, if you look at any of the geologic history pages on Earth at Home that we've made so far, this pops up again and again, uh, just because it, it's a big part of the geologic history of North America. But we do have these nice updated images of uh, shells. So in this case, uh, these two, uh, come from Wikipedia, these Cretaceous shells. Uh, we've taken things from actual scientific papers. So these shark teeth are from a, a Creative Commons licensed paper. And in some cases we do have some reconstructions. So this Mosasaur, if you look at the jaw, it's kind of cool. It's got, it's got weird teeth on it. 
but it's hard to imagine what the whole creature looks like. So we get these nice reconstructions in here as well. Um, so the coastal plain goes mainly through the Mesozoic and then through the Cenozoic. Some of these are original images that were created for the teacher from the guides. So PRI uh, is very rich in terms of its collections and fossils from the Southeast. This is something that paleontologists at our institution tend to focus on. So there are quite a few shell collections from the Southeast and lots of examples of those. Uh, some things come from PRI affiliated websites as well. So this is uh, another thing from Neogene Atlas of Ancient Life, which is a, a, a website that's also run by PRI and has a lot of nice pictures. Um, from this region as well. Uh, some examples of shell pits, these were taken, I think, by John. So the whole point here was just to sort of, as, as Rob said, enrich the visual aspect of this. So there are a lot of really nice, uh, high quality color pictures. And if you want even better quality, a lot of these. So we've kind of optimized them to a certain size so they load well on the web. But in a lot of cases, we have links to the original source. So you can go in if you want a, an even higher quality uh, version of the picture and download that yourself to, to uh, use in your teaching. So um, in, in also in terms of this page, one of the things that was updated a bit was the section on marine mammals. Uh, there are a lot of interesting early whale fossils that happen to come from the Southeast. Unfortunately, a lot of them are fairly fragmentary but there are some of these nice sort of four-legged ancestral whales. So that was one of the cool parts of working on this page in a nice 3D model. Uh, this comes from the Charleston Museum, a part of a skull of Tupelocetus, which is one of these early whales and it's got labels on it. So the web also does allow us to embed these videos in 3D models as well, um, right into the page. So that kind of, I guess, gives an overview of what this is like and there's some updated plant content too. Um, yeah. So, John. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for sharing that stuff, Liz. Um, so, I think what we wanted to do next is to uh, give all of you, you know, ten minutes or thereabouts to kind of explore Earth at home, if if you like, and um, you know, just just kind of look through some pages, and then we can come back and discuss, you know, some of the things you found, some of the things you didn't find, and and hope to find, you know, if, if you're, if you're wondering, you know, what, what in particular you, you might look for, you know, we'd like to hear maybe what are some resources that you have seen already in this presentation or in your own explorations of Earth at Home that you might use in your, in your own classrooms. We'd, we'd love to hear about that. Um, and, or maybe you'd like to share something uh, interesting about the earth science of the place where you live and let us know whether you found any coverage of that topic on, on Earth at Home, um, or if, if there's not any content, what, what you'd like to see us develop in the future. Don, Rob, any additional thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I'll just say, so um, it's 520 right now, so um, take, uh, let's say five minutes and just uh, go and explore your state if you're either in the southeast or south central regions those are um, the regions that are uh, fully fleshed out and if if you're not in one of those regions then pretend you live there or, or go to a, a state you're interested in looking at and, and poke around and see what you see and um, and in five minutes we'll uh, we'll just uh, come back and hear what folks found interesting and sometimes this happens in breakout groups. We're not doing breakout groups, right? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's a small enough group. That yeah, we'll so, we'll, so we'll just be here. Yeah. <laughs> so feel free to interact with us. Um, and uh, so it doesn't have to be a quiet space, but you're welcome to just kind of look around and uh, but ask questions or chat in the meantime. Right, and it's 521, so we'll go till 526 and then we'll, we'll ask you to share something. have fun.
if you uh, are wondering how to get back to the home page of the Southeast, uh, I'm putting that link in the chat. should put on uh, music. <laughs> One thing I'll add is, is folks are looking for resources on Earth at Home is the search bar works sort of amazingly well. And I, I oftentimes search bars don't work that well on websites, but for reasons that are beyond me and uh, the search bar seems to, whatever we've plugged in seems to really do a good job. So if you're looking for something in particular, feel free to type it into the search bar at the top and it'll bring up you know, every page on Earth at Home's website where that search term is is uh is present did you see marley's uh, comment in the chat john yeah i was going to look into that hmm. yeah it seems like they've got to be in there someplace but maybe not You know, it's it's a great suggestion for an addition for us to make because it certainly is a very well known um, fossil locality. I do see a couple pings of you know, there's a 3D model of um, Terra Trigonia, um, which is uh, uh, the state fossil of of Tennessee, which seems to be from the Coon Creek Formation. So it's um, looks like it's Cretaceous in age. Okay, it's 526. Uh, so let's hear what, uh, uh, what folks have been uh, poking around at. Uh, anyone want to share? Should we call on someone? Mm -hmm. Pretty good at wait time. You are all so shy. <laughs> so 
So uh, uh, to remind you a couple things, just to like, you can say anything, but um, one thing that we'd be interested in hearing about is how you think, you know, if you think you might use this resource in your teaching, what do you think is the most useful thing about it? That's useful to hear because it helps us to think about as we move on to the next regions or even this region, what should we expand upon? But also, what's what's missing? Did you go to your state and find? Wait a second. Where's where's my local geology? So maybe it is big enough for us to uh, go into breakout groups and enforce people to talk if they're <laughs> if they're not going to talk in this this group mm. how about if we do go into breakout groups for five minutes and uh um uh, um and uh we'll have you share things in five minutes and, we'll... and that'll help us to get to know you a little bit as well all right, so maybe we can. Hello, sir. I am very puzzled. I don't know what's what you got going on. Hold on just a second. Let me get you. Uh, oops.
Welcome back. And I think there's people still popping in. So let's just go around and, and hear um, one thought from each of the three uh, breakout groups to start. So room one was Araya, Carol, Eric, John, and Marley. Does someone want to share from room one? What you were talking about? Yeah, Carol or Marley, would you like to share some of the comments you made? Go ahead, Carol. Oh, I, Carol, I think you're muted. Yeah. We were just pointing out our different uses from uh, elementary through through grad school in terms of using the images and animations and models. That's all. Um, how about uh, some a thought from room two, which was Christy, David, Liz, and Rob? Um, our conversation was really all over the place, but uh, Christy and David both had lots to say. Do you want to? <laughs> uh, we didn't only talk about the Southeast, but do uh, you want to say anything? We have a, have a thought. Uh, I just mentioned that. Uh, there's a lot of information on here about um, about energy resources and, and the climate change and the community that I work in in southeast Kentucky is kind of in a transitionary period between a, a, a coal extractive. Um, historically, you know, our communities have been very related to that and in the past those topics have been difficult to broach because of uh, the economic interest of the companies in the area so it's nice to have those topics all here and then linked to interrelated topics to make those conversations and transitions more uh, just easier to have with students. That's great to hear. Yeah. Um, yeah, and let's hear from uh, room three, which was uh, Debbie, Michael, and Tyler. Yes. Hi, this is, this, this is Mike. I, I am uh, actually not a, a teacher or a non-professional in paleontology. Uh, I'm actually a retired uh, pharmaceutical researcher with a with a about a 15 year long interest in paleontology and geology. So I do a lot of reading on it. Uh, I bought a couple of the the, uh, the regional guides from from the paleontological institute. So I I found my first browsing through the the site excellent because from a non professional point of view, the visuals were just bringing things complex ideas were, were excellent. Uh, so I. I I can't, you know, I can't say a, enough about it from someone who's not a professional, doesn't have a formal educational background. It's just excellent. Uh, I was looking, uh, I'm from the Northeast Massachusetts, but we've been in Florida for the last few months. So I was just out of interest looking at the Southeast and, and Florida. And you see the big, the big picture. Uh, I was wondering if you could focus in and maybe I need to look a little more. Say you wanted to be interested in Florida alone or Massachusetts alone. And I know it's part of a bigger picture but it's nice to see the progression within the state that you're in. And I, I don't know if I saw that or, or maybe need to look a little further. Yeah, I mean, it's really, we found that sort of carving this up is, is difficult because if you, you know, if you just focused on a state, the, the sort of natural boundaries don't always follow the, yeah. you know, the, the political boundaries. And I think that's the, that sort of is one of the challenges. Um, okay. You know, I, I think as time goes on, what we're hoping to do sort of this first pass of Earth at Home is to get this sort of framework content online for the entire country. And then what we'll do is we'll sort of start adding, you know, a lot, we'll start sprinkling additional detail that's sort of much more focused at the state level throughout the website. You know, so for example, right now, Florida is just sort of considered within the, the coastal plain physiographic province, but over time we'll start adding, you know, sort of more vignettes focused on different aspects of the earth science of Florida. It's just sort of an example. So we're sort of trying to build the framework here in the first pass. And then we'll start developing the, uh, we'll start adding content to a greater level of detail in the future. That, that's well, kind of our plan right now. Well, anyway, I, as I said, I found the, 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 the pictures, the, the, the graphics, excellent. And it does look like Florida was probably underwater for 
massive amounts of time, and that's why there's time. a lot of limestone here and, and limestone type sand. So, yeah, that the picture behind me here is a picture that I actually took in December of 2021. That's a that's a shell pit in Florida. So I do my research on mollusk shells from yeah. from Florida and elsewhere. And you know, these are basically ground up to make road base. Um, at this yes. particular quarry, this material is being quarried out to uh, build the bed for a high-speed train, you know, between Miami and Orlando that's going to go in, in in the future. So, okay, yeah, I have to, to break for some company coming. I hope you don't mind a non-professional oh, no, no. attending these. Oh, no, thank you for attending. Yeah. Really appreciate it. And if there's anything I can uh, add or talk to you in the future, I'd love to be, be involved with uh, some of the research or whatever you do. So. That's wonderful. Thanks very much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, you've got a few minutes to go yet. Um, so uh, uh, another question, um, sort of general, is you know there are people teaching at a variety of levels here, and uh, and of course that makes it uh, that's a challenge to uh, do a broadly applicable um, resource. Um, and I know there are some middle school folks, at least who registered. I'm not sure if uh, if they're actually in the session or not, but I'm wondering if uh, if we've targeted it, if it's a resource that works for middle school teachers or elementary teachers, um, or if you can figure out how to adapt it to your setting. Greeted by silence. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a topic that came up in our in in our breakout group. You know, one of the things we're trying to do with Earth at Home is to to try to make it applicable to many different audiences. You know, teachers, people, students, um, folks at all sorts of different. At different levels, we think some of the content is probably appropriate uh, at an appropriate level for, um, say, college students taking their very first class in in earth science. But we're hoping that other aspects might be useful, even in a you know in a elementary school classroom. So, for instance, those pages that I highlighted, you know, related to um, quick facts about individual states, we're hoping will appeal to to uh, younger kids, you know, who are sort of just more interested in, in the factoids, you know, what's the state fossil, what's the state rock, what's the highest place, that, that sort of thing. So any suggestions that you might have about, you know, content that, that could be added or tailored to the group of students who you work with would certainly be welcome. What else do we do you need from us is another question. Yeah, think about, re, you know, resources that you've looked for before, especially online, you know, for your own classrooms and had a hard time finding it. Maybe there's, maybe there's some way that we can help. Are there, are there resources like that? group it is it is the day on a on a thursday so um uh i i will note on a uh a different note that uh we did put some uh um upcoming events at the uh, uh bottom of the agenda um and uh uh one of those is next thursday we have a twice a month uh, uh program uh called science in in the pub uh, and next week we'll have Andana Singh talking about uh, storytelling and climate uh, change education. And she's an awesome speaker, a physics professor and a science fiction author, among other things. Um, and uh, the link is there in the agenda. And we just finalized today that we're doing a um, workshop on climate change anxiety on uh, Monday, May 2nd. And that info is there too. <laughs> Um, and uh, glad to talk about whatever and stick around and, and talk about the resources. And I, I think uh, Rob is going to stick in um, 
There he is, uh, putting in a question for our, our little exit survey. And like I said, glad to stick around and answer any questions and uh, talk more about the full suite of resources. Earth at Home is gigantic. Uh, so there are tons of things there that we can explore if you want to ask individual questions of us. So yeah. yeah no, uh, oh, sorry, Jen. Oh, I was just going to add in as well. If, if you have, you know, if you think of comments later or questions that you have for us, please email us. Um, there's a link at the bottom of every single Earth at Home page, including the home page that says contact us. And there's a little email link. And so just click on that and it'll, it'll send you to the, a good email address to, to use where we'll make sure we receive your message. Yes. And the agenda has all of our email addresses as well. Yes, that's right. So the, the agenda will continue to exist. So if you need to go back to it, you think, oh yeah, I forgot, where's that link? You know, I mean, if you have, the, if you keep the, the uh, link to the agenda, then you'll have the other links as well. And um, the, uh, and John just put in an, an email address for Earth at Home generally. Um, and then the exit survey is very short. So it will just take you a, a minute or two. Uh, so if you could do that, uh, we would be deeply grateful. And thank you for attending today. Yeah, thanks very much, everybody. And we'll, we'll just kind of hang out here if anybody wants to uh, um, ask or say anything else, or just wants to chat. I think, Don, we have some interesting things maybe to talk about at some point with uh, David <laughs> about climate change and energy. Sounds like he's doing some very interesting work awesome. in Kentucky. Yeah, and I'll, I'll note to uh, uh, John, Liz, and Rob that uh, Mike was planning to be here but ran into some technical difficulties, so. Okay. It is such a quiet group. <laughs> mm -hmm. Getting to the end of the year, end of the day. <laughs> Every time I try to talk, my dog jumps in and he's <laughs> licking my face. But I was going to say this was great. And maybe we were just all a little bit shy. I don't really know. But I do teach in uh, New York State. But I said these resources would be really good for me because even though I'm focused on the Northeast because of the Regents exam, I think it's good to look at other stuff. So it, I think it'll be beneficial to use in class. And I also said how we're switching to the next generation science standards. I think it'll come in handy then, like when I have to rethink everything. So it's a very valuable resource. Yeah, yeah thanks. And, and yeah. we'll be developing the Northeast. Oh, sorry. Don. Yeah, I was just going to say we'll, we're developing the Northeast. And, you know, so we'll have similar content available for the Northeast by later this year. Yeah. Perfect. I did sign up for all of the sessions. Oh, great. Oh, great. <laughs> Super. And yeah, please consider if you haven't done so signing up for that email, you know, that email list and once a month or so, we'll just send out some updates about what's been added. Okay, yeah. perfect. I, I think you were talking about Don something on May 2nd, but I, I didn't, I didn't see it. So like in an email, yeah, so I may have missed the, it. No, it's at the bottom of the agenda. Um, so, uh, Okay. We still got the agenda link. Uh, nope. Um, so let me just share screen myself. And I okay. Can... Yeah, and we just uh, just finalized this today. So if you go to the agenda and scroll down to the bottom, there's the coming events and there's science in the pub, and below that is the um, climate emotions matter um, workshop, and it's. Uh, split onto the next page, the registration is there. Okay, perfect. Yep. Thank yeah, you. I'm looking forward to that. We're doing that in in cooperation with the Climate Mental Health Network, and there's a link uh, to their resources there too. Perfect. And I'll, since I've got the screen out, I'll also uh, note uh, here's the info for uh, Bandana's uh, talk a week from tonight at 7.30. I think I'm signed up for that one, but I'll double check. So thank you. Great, great, great. 
my dogs are getting a little antsy. So yeah. I'm going to go, but thank you all so much. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much for attending. Have a good night. <laughs> you too. <laughs> good night to your pooch too. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Tyler. Yeah, that's very cool, Tyler. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Do you know where you're going to school? Yeah. Awesome. Oh, very nice. Right. Yep. I have, a, I have a friend at Moorhead State um, and uh, I'm trying to remember where Margaret Carter is. Remember, where, where's Stephen Grab, John? Remember? I think he's at the Kentucky Geological Survey, but that he might, that they might have their offices at the university. I'm not sure. Hmm. Stephen Grab is a paleontologist who does a lot of public outreach. Um, yeah. Uh, just chime in. Something that I think is really interesting about this that I was just thinking about is, you know, in our area, you know, I mean, with younger kids especially, I mean, one of the biggest draws of geology is, I mean, is, you know, it's our fossils. And we just, there aren't any, you know, dinosaur fossils in Kentucky. So it sometimes feels like it's difficult to get younger students engaged with geology. So to have a resource where we can look, you know, the virtual collections and stuff, I think that's really a, a cool thing because, Especially with, you know, I mean, in my area, the majority of our history in terms of geology was, you know, how it related to coal and, and the industry mm -hmm. that was so instrumental to family survival for all those years. So I like th that I can that I can turn to this and I can and I can use these virtual collections to show kids fossils and things that they're not likely to see otherwise, unless it's mm -hmm. like an, a, st a static stale image in a book, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting thought and um uh so i want to so said do you I, are there um i mean kentucky's fairly fossil rich but i guess maybe especially carboniferous plants yeah they're, they're not the, they're not yeah. the fun the, the fun fossils you know yeah, right. <laughs> Which, i'm from louisville originally and i used to go to the, the falls of ohio as a kid and i loved oh, that I, yeah. thought it was, I thought it was amazing right but, you know i mean that's not something that kids in the region that i'm in now have you know, access to. So right, I, I just, I, I feel like there's just not really a lot of excitement concerning geology mm -hmm. in this region, you know, and, which is a shame. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think yeah. the resources like this are really yeah. helpful for that. Yeah, good. Yeah, and my, my experience is that it doesn't have to be a dinosaur fossil for kids yeah. to get excited about it. I mean, um, the, uh, there's a site near us called the Pendixie Fossil Park, which uh, is uh, crinoids and trilobites and um, oh, yeah. and things like that and uh, kids love it you know but, and yeah I think that there is something to the to the whole finding and exploring that sometimes even if it's not a dinosaur but I, I agree like if you don't have that close enough by for for kids to like do hands on then that is a challenge and in many cases that's the case um, yeah. And, but, you know, it, uh, having the, you know, hopefully it'd be interesting to know if the 3D images will help. Certainly uh, it's better, like you said, than static images. And I wonder, um, you know, there, we, we've talked over the years about the possibility of being able to, you know, sh ship samples of fossils and that kind of thing, which, is certainly doable, but hard to scale up. Um, right. But uh, but you know it's something that we've we've done on a small scale uh, for uh, uh, fossils of a variety of ages. <laughs> um. But yeah, it's it's very interesting to, to hear about your work and the idea of helping uh, people. Transition out of the, you know the, the coal uh, dependency and or the coal economy, I guess, because that's a to me it's a matter of identity. Yeah, you know, I mean, like for centuries, you know, people's identity 
a specific an identity with the land. And the only identity that they had with the land was one of an extractive resource, which mm-hmm. don't get me wrong, it's what made this entire region what it is today. But we, there's there's somewhat of a vacuum left now. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess my personal goal is to find a way to fill that vacuum with with a broad based kind of you know environmental education mm-hmm. you know for these kids to make their own decisions and 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 just follow the science and, and and to have a new relationship to to the land around them and the environment around them that hopefully is more positive in these in southeast kentucky we're we're really starting to transition to more of like a um, an ecotourism or an outdoor mm-hmm. re- uh, recreation model you know mm-hmm. a lot of the use of the reclaimed strip mines and so i mean that's definitely a more positive interaction yeah, it's in my a, eyes it's such a, a beautiful region so mm-hmm. i can see yeah it could be uh they you know could really see it in a, in a different way and and um and with a different kind of value huh that's fascinating yeah yeah do you do um biological work as well like biodiversity counts and that sort of thing yeah i mean i've so, you know, I, I, I'm a lay individual, you know, I'm just a passionate person who, and a nature nerd. So I spend as much time recently with people in various fields as possible. I, I'm a Kentucky master naturalist. So uh, every time I see anything through EKU or UK, I just show up and, and try to like ask as many questions of all the, the doctors there as I can, you know, and find out everything. So, I mean, I have done, we did a, this week is a, um, the Kentucky Native Plant Society's uh, Botany Blitz. So I got out with iNaturalist and did some of that and then participated exactly. in a couple of in-person things also, stuff like that. But yeah, I enjoy all of that. Mm-hmm. That's kind of where I was, I was actually going to mention iNaturalist, but yeah. sure you're already plugged into that because yeah. that's some, something we've been trying to do more of. Um, but it's, you know, it's been kind of sl- slow, you know, it, it feels a little technical. So it's been slow going and getting like a large public engagement. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's like that initial bump in the mm-hmm. learning curve there. You know, it's it's not difficult once you learn the basics because everything is built off those basics. But I think for some people, like you said, there could be some intimidation there getting past that initial threshold. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Any other uh, closing thoughts? Um. Well, uh, yeah, Tyler and David, it, it's been great to, to have you on. And so I look for, I hope we, our circles um, cross again at some point, because I think there are lots of interesting things that we have in common. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe Tyler will run across you at a geology conference mm-hmm. or to come up and visit us and we can yeah. talk about uh, we'll geology directions. Yeah. yeah. Take you into the field. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks all. And all right. Yeah. Have a nice evening. Thank you all. Okay. Good night. Bye.